Hello friends, this is 3ABN Sabbath School panel and we are excited that you are joining us because we are making our way through our study on the topic of death, dying and the future hope. That's the subtitle of our overall lesson entitled Life Everlasting and we're excited because we're, I mean this thing's went by pretty quickly, lesson number 10. It seems like we've only been doing it for a couple of days uh, but it's been excited. It's been excited study and uh, this week we're going to be talking about the fires of hell. This is a very, very important subject and uh, I encourage you to tune in, watch the whole thing because uh, the devil has attacked this subject as we have found a lot of subjects he's attacking in these last days to try to skew and pervert the truth in regards to God's word on these particular subjects. And so I would like to introduce my family members, the panel members with us today to my direct left, my good friend, Pastor Terry Shelton. It's good to have you, brother. Thank you, Ryan, and glad to be here. I'll be presenting Monday's lesson, which is also entitled, The Fires of Hell. All right, nice. And of course, to your left is Pastor James Rafferty. How are you, my brother? I'm fantastic. Good to be here, Ryan. And I have Tuesday's lesson, The Saints in Purgatory. Oh, nice. All right. And of course, to your left is Miss Jill Morricone. How are you? Doing well, brother. I have Wednesday, A Paradise with the Disembodied Souls. Ah, all right. Okay. And then down at the far end of this big table, last but not least, <laughs> our good dear sister, Shelly Quinn. How are you? Oh, I'm blessed. And mine is the biblical view, who has eternal life. All right. All right. The fires of hell. Before we pray, I just got to, I got to read this memory text because it's short, sweet, but really, really just, I mean, provides substantial oversight to everything we're studying here. It comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21. This is coming from the New King James Version. It says, test all things, hold fast what is good. That's, that must be certainly applied to what we're studying today. So before we go any further, let's have a prayer. And Brother James Rafferty, would you pray for us? Sure, let's pray. Father, I want to thank you again for your word for the Holy Spirit, for our audience, for the opportunity that we have to study, to learn, to grow. Speak to us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. amen. Sabbath afternoon's lesson brings out an interesting story that I have to read because it talks about Italian poet Dante, and if I say this correctly in the appropriate sense, Alighieri, Alighieri, that's a nice name, mm -hmm. Dante Alighieri wrote his famous work, The Divine Comedy, about a fictional journey of the soul after death. The soul went either to the inferno, which is hell, within the earth, or to purgatory, where the human spirit can purge itself and become worthy of ascending to heaven, or to paradise, to the presence of God himself. Though only a poem, fiction, Okay, Dante's word ended up having a great deal of influence on Christian theology, especially Roman Catholic theology. The basic notion of an immortal soul's going either to hell or to purgatory or to paradise is foundational to that church. Many conservative Protestant denominations also believe in an immortal soul that after death ascends either to paradise or descends to hell. Indeed, if all human souls never die, okay, then it has to go somewhere after the body dies, right? Mm -hmm. In short, a false understanding of human nature has led to a terrible theology of errors. And I can attest to this because I, I this is what I, Shelly, you, you know this as well. We grew up believing this. We grew yes. up believing that when a person dies, well, they have this, this, this substance this, uh, that, that, that inside them is this soul, this, this invisible ghost-like person with intelligence and understanding and knowledge. And at the point of death, it's separated uh, you know, from the body and it mm -hmm. floats into an abyss of either paradise to be with God forever mm -hmm. or if you're a bad person and you didn't believe in Jesus, you burn in hell for all eternity. Mm -hmm. This was basically my past. In fact, mm -hmm. I grew up, uh, as, a, as a little Pentecostal boy and you're talking about fire and brimstone sermons. I mean, that's what I went through all my life and, and, and it wasn't nothing to hear a preacher stand up and tell people that if you don't live this way and you don't live that way and you don't believe this and you don't wear this and you don't you know, act like this and th then you're going straight to hell and you're going to burn for all eternity. I mean, this is what I heard uh, for the vast majority of my upbringing. Mm. But yet when we put these things to the test and we simply ask ourselves, can this ideology or this belief, uh, can it fit within the concept of what we know to be a God of love? You know, the Bible says God is love. Can those two things coexist? 
we're going to put it to the test today. Sunday's lesson is entitled Immortal Worms. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's creative. Immortal Worms. And of course, this is taken from, uh, well, there's a couple of passages that mention this, but we're specifically reading today Mark chapter 9, verse 42 to 48. So if you have your Bibles, let's go there. Mark chapter 9, and we're going to read verses 42 to 48. And I'll start reading there right now. So it says in verse 42 of Mark chapter 9, But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. By the way, this is Jesus speaking. He goes on to say, If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Mm. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell and to the fire that shall never be quenched. And then verse 44, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed rather than having two feet. It says to be cast into hell into the fire that shall not be quenched, where again the worm does not die and the fire not quenched. Verse 47, and if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than to have two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where again the worm does not die and the <laughs> fire is not quenched. Have you ever met an immortal worm or have you ever held an immortal worm no. or heard of an immortal <laughs> worm? Obviously, uh, we have to understand this within the context of what the passage is teaching. And we have to do a little bit of digging to understand what exactly is Jesus saying here. You know, Jesus often used m metaphors and illustrations to communicate the likeness of the reality of heaven and the realities of the will of God. This passage, of course, that we're reading is no different. The word for hell here, and that's where kind of a lot of people get a little, you know, they get a little confused because their concept of hell is this eternal burning hot, hot pit in the center of the earth. But of course, the word here in this passage that we just read for hell, uh, it's from the original Greek word Gehenna. And of course, this was a region in the Valley of Hinnom outside of Jerusalem. Gehenna was a giant city dump or a landfill in which animal carcasses and, mm -hmm. and, and, and you know, uh, rubbish and all kinds of trash was disposed of. So what was not destroyed by the smoldering fires was, of course, eaten and consumed by worms and maggots. Mm. So basically, Christ is using Gehenna as a metaphor for hellfire at the end of the world. And of course, I reference here Matthew chapter 13, verse 40. If you read that passage there, and it specifically is pertaining to the parable of the wheat and the tares, and verse 40 in Matthew chapter uh, 13 says, Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, mm. so will it be at the end of this age. So when will hellfire be? When will the burning take place in which God deals with the destruction of the wicked? Is it right now? End of the age. Uh, okay, well, just Jesus right. himself just confirmed in this parable at the end of this world or at the end of the age. We haven't arrived there yet. Mm. Uh, Gehenna is a representation of the destructive lake of fire at the end of time. And of course, we read about this in Revelation chapter 20, verses 9 and 10, within the context of the destruction of the wicked at the end of the thousand years. Mm. Notice what it says there in Revelation 20, verse 9 and 10. It says, They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Mm -hmm. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophets are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. We know, of course, we're going to probably cover this at some point. Of course, that forever and ever is a definite period of time. Mm -hmm. It means until the fires have served its purpose in burning up and destroying the sin. Mm -hmm. And so also we know the devil's not in charge of hell. That's a mm -hmm. myth we're going to bust right now. <laughs> the devil's not in charge of hell. Mm -hmm. uh, the devil can't be in charge of hell, otherwise he wouldn't be able to be thrown into mm -hmm. the lake of fire. Uh, in this case, God is in control of the destruction of the wicked and the devil will find his place in that lake of fire as we just read. Mm -hmm. uh, so don't get too caught up on you know, the worm not dying because this again is a metaphorical language describing the everlasting results of hell fire, uh, not the burning itself. And so in fact, we know this to be figurative language because worms cannot feast on disembodied souls mm -hmm. according to the popular erroneous belief of the immortality of the soul. Of course, I, was, I grew up with this belief, you know, this idea that we have a soul with a substance in us that's, that's separated or liberated from the body at the point of death. Well, how's a worm going to feast on something that doesn't have flesh or bones mm -hmm. or 
anything like that. So that, of course, is another example given that kind of disproves this idea of the literalness of what comes to the mind when you think of an immortal worm feasting on people's bodies and souls forever and ever. It just It's not biblical at all. Of course, in contrast, the Bible makes it clear that the wicked enter hell fire with their whole body. Notice what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 30. Mm. This says, and if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your, here it is, mm. your whole body mm. be cast into hell. So when that hell fire is ignited and sin must enter, sin must be destroyed, anyone who's holding on to that sin, mm. who have not turned it over to Jesus in the appropriate time, their whole body will be cast into hell fire according to the Bible. So where where the worm does not die is allegorical language describing the eternal everlasting results of hellfire. So notice how Jesus also says in verse 48, mm -hmm. uh, and the fire is not quenched, okay? So this is referencing the fact that no one can put out the fires of hell until it has served its purpose. We made that point in just a few moments ago at the point in which God is going to eradicate sin. And so, uh, and I know Brother Terry's probably going to get into this a little bit more, uh, but my lesson also contained this verse, Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Uh, we see here that the wicked will be brought to ashes. Mm -hmm. And so it says in Malachi chapter 4, verse 1, one through three, for behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble, and the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will, that will leave them neither root nor branch. Verse three, you shall trample, speaking of the wicked, you shall, or excuse me, the righteous, you shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I shall do this, says the Lord of hosts. Mm -hmm. So we know that the fires will only go out after sin has been completely destroyed and not a moment before. And I think that's going to be made clear today throughout the lessons as we kind of overlap each other. There's going to be a little bit of repeating. But the point is, my friends, is that God is love. The Bible says God is love. Mm -hmm. And I don't, you know, I just cannot, I've been brought to the point in my life where I cannot believe that God is going to allow someone to burn for ceaseless, eternal ages to infinity and beyond. Uh, that is not a God of love. Now, will there be an appropriate judgment brought up on uh, those according to their works? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, that is the case. And I believe God makes that very clear in His Word. But I, I just want to encourage you for the remainder of today's lesson, Get you, if you haven't gotten your pen, your pen and your, your notepad or however you take notes, get it out. Get ready to take notes because this subject has deceived so many. The devil has deceived so many on this particular subject. So many people choose to serve God, the God of the Bible, because of the perversion that the devil has brought up on this topic. And today, as I said before, we're going to extinguish the myths. We're going to set the record straight. And so at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Terry for Monday's lesson. Thank you, Ryan. Amen. Friends, if you don't have a quarterly, I'm going to read a portion of the quarterly that um, I think is very, very relevant. It says, in his booklet for children entitled, The Sight of Hell, get that, a book for children entitled, mm -hmm. The Sight of Hell, English Roman Catholic priest John Furness illustrates the eternal torment by means of a great solid iron ball larger than the heavens and the earth. A bird comes once in a million years and just touches the great iron ball with a feather of its wing. The author argues that the burning of sinners in hell continues even after the iron ball is worn away mm. by such occasional feather touches. Wow. Mm. Yeah. I, I can't imagine writing a book for children about this. Where do such teachings come from? Mm. Well, we know ultimately where these teachings come from. They come from the father of lies, right? That's right. You know, Absolutely. the devil and Satan himself. But interestingly, as I studied this subject a little bit, I found uh, evidence of a, a sermon given in the year 1741 by a congregational minister named Jonathan Edwards. Yeah. And he preached this sermon entitled, Sinner in the Hands of an Angry God. Wow. And I just want to read just a, a short portion of this, and you'll get an idea of where these erroneous teachings have come from. And I quote, The God that holds you over the pit of hell, much as one holds a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire, abhors you mm. wow. and is dreadfully provoked. Mm. His wrath towards you burns like fire. Mm. He looks upon you as, a worthy, as worthy of nothing else 
but to be cast into the fire. He is of purer eyes than to bear you in his sight. You are 10,000 times as abominable in his eyes as the most hateful, mm. venomous serpent is in ours. Mm. Now, this is a Christian preacher mm. delivering this message mm. and he goes on. Mm. It would be dreadful to suffer this fierceness and wrath of Almighty God for even one moment, but you must suffer it for all eternity. Mm. There will be no end to this exquisite, horrible misery. When you look forward, you shall see along forever a boundless duration before you, which will swallow up your thoughts and amaze your soul. And you will absolutely despair of ever having any deliverance, any end, any mitigation, any rest at all. You will know certainly that you must wear out long ages, millions of millions of ages in wrestling with this almighty merciless vengeance. Mm. And then when you have done so, when, you, when so many ages have actually been spent by you in this manner, you will know that all is but a point to what remains so that your punishment will indeed be infinite. Oh. It breaks my heart oh, to nice. hear a, a preacher who would preach oh. a message of supposedly hope <laughs> and forgiveness that to his congregation. Mm. Friends, is our Heavenly Father a tyrant who delights oh. in our eternal torment? Mm. I'm glad that we don't serve that kind of God. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad that none of us serve that kind of God, a God who would burn sinners for all eternity. We've already referenced it, that 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8 tells us that God is love. Yes. That's right. What kind of loving God would do that to those who are lost? So, eternal fire. What is eternal fire? And how do we reconcile the words of Paul when he said, the wages of sin is? Death. Death, death right? Not the wages of sin is eternal life in, in, in fire. The wages of sin is death. Mm -hmm. And the idea that some have that God will burn sinners forever. Well, let's look at a couple of passages. We already referenced uh, the book of Malachi, chapter 4 and verse 1. Brother Ryan read it, very, read it very well. It says that we will tread the ashes of the wicked under the soles of our feet. It said that the day is coming, burning like an oven. Mm. All the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up. Mm that will leave them neither root nor branch. Also in the book of Jude, chapter, uh, in Jude verse 7, <laughs> where it talks about Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality mm. and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal, eternal fire. Mm. In Matthew chapter 18 and verse 8, Jesus referenced everlasting fire. Also in Mark chapter 9 and verse 43, Jesus mentioned a fire that shall never be quenched. Friends, if the fire were everlasting, then it should be burning now, right? But clearly it is not. Clearly eternal fire means that the results of the fire are eternal and not the fire itself. So let's ask a hypothetical question here. What if God were actually the kind of God who inflicted the punishing process that lasted forever? Mm. Well, in that case, then evil would never truly be completely eradicated. Mm. Right. True. God would have to somehow perpetuate that, if you want to call it life, in the fires of hell. Mm -hmm. Would it not be more merciful just to end their existence and bring it all to a close? In addition to that, we would make God out to be a liar. For he said in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 33 and verse 11, I have no pleasure mm. in the death mm. of the wicked. I'm glad for that, my friends. Mm -hmm. oh, no. God has no pleasure. Uh, in another portion of the scriptures, it is called God's strange act. Mm. Yes. Something completely contrary yes. to his nature that will one day happen here on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. Also in Revelation 22 and verse 12, we talked about it before. <coughs> Behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me yes. to give to everyone according to his works. Mm -hmm. But if Jesus is going to reward us according to our works, then it would be completely unjustified 
for a, a blatantly vile and wicked person and perhaps someone who doesn't have so many marks against them in judgment, especially if they lived for a very short time. It wouldn't be fair for them to receive the same sentence. Um, I'm glad that God is going to give. He, God judges righteously. Mm -hmm. God's, ju God's judgment will be fair and righteous and just and perfect. And, um, you know, imagine, imagine if we 10,000 years from now, and this is just hypothetically, 10,000 years from now, and we have, we have made it home and we're enjoying the eternal life that God has prepared for us. But imagine there's a little pocket off in the universe somewhere mm -hmm. where those who didn't accept Christ are burning and mm -hmm. burning and mm -hmm. burning and burning. Would you want to live in a paradise like that, knowing that mm -hmm. that is going on somewhere? Mm -hmm. What kind of God would do such a thing? All Bible references to the eternal fire should be seen as allusions to the post-millennium lake of fire in Revelation 20. And therefore, it is unbiblical to speak of an already present, ever burning hell. Mm. And I like this part. In the book of Nahum, chapter 1 and verse 9, it says, yeah. Affliction mm. will not That's rise right. up That's the right. second time. <laughs> God is going to cleanse this earth. We've seen it in, in, in past studies, and we'll see it some more today. God is going to cleanse this earth, and every trace of sin and sinners will be gone, including the devil and his angels. Praise yeah, God yeah. for that. Mm -hmm. And it will not rise up a second time. Why? Because God said so. That's why. <laughs> That's right. Friends, maybe you're new to this teaching. Maybe the, you, like Ryan and like Shelley, grew up in churches where um, they taught that God will burn sinners forever and ever. What I learned when, what I learned in reading that passage from. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, is that it was during that time that this teaching began to really become popular in Protestant churches. And before that, it wasn't really taught so much in Protestant churches. But it seemed like that sermon that he preached just grabbed a hold and took hold of so many of the, of the um, blossoming denominations were coming up. Mm -hmm. But if this is new to you, I invite you to call 3ABN, write to 3ABN, ask for material. There are, there are books written by people that are an integral part of 3ABN who can answer the question of, does God love sinners forever? Mm. Wow, Amen. wow. Thank you so Amen. much, brother, for that. It's a powerful study, my friends, and we don't want you to go anywhere. We're just going to take a short break, and we will be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Hello, friends. Welcome back to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We're going to toss it over to Pastor James Rafferty for Tuesday's lesson. Tuesday's lesson. Thank you, Ryan Day. Tuesday's lesson, The Saints in Purgatory. And I just want to say as we get started here that on this panel of five, we outnumber the Adventists. Uh, I was raised Roman Catholic. We've got Shelley over here, Church of Christ. We've got Ryan over here, Pentecostal. Mm -hmm. And so all three of us who outnumber the other two, all three of us know what it's like to be raised in a church that teaches the idea of eternally burning hell. And we know why it's taught. The, one of the reasons why it's taught is because it's motivational. You can't stop telling people they're not going to burn forever and ever because they'll stop coming to church if they think that, you know, that God isn't going to burn them in hell forever and ever. And it's the same with purgatory. We're dealing with purgatory here. And in a sense, as a young man, purgatory was like this last ditch effort, this last ditch mm. hope, I should say. You know, if I'm not good enough to make it to heaven, at least I can make it to purgatory. And then people can pray me out and I can, you know, do the things I need to do to finally get to the place where I can get to heaven. But all of it, all of it is really undermining 
the character of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. So our author here quotes from the Roman Catholic Church and we're just gonna look at this quotation. I think it's an important one, but I just wanna say ahead of time, he's not quoting now from some ancient manuscript that was printed by the church back in the dark ages. This is a statement that's coming from 1995. This is 20th century mm -hmm. teaching or doctrine, okay? And he goes on here and he says, the catechism of the Catholic Church is explicit about purgatory, quote, all who die in God's grace and friendship, but still imperfectly purified, that's what I thought I would end up being, are indeed assured of their eternal salvation. Oh yes, okay, I'm an altar boy, I pray every night, whether I'm drunk or sober, I'm not quite sure if we're gonna make it, you know. They are assured of eternal salvation, but after death they must undergo purification so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. And that's the well, Catholic, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, New York, Double Day, 1995, page 291. It states, too, that their suffering can be alleviated by the prayers of their loved ones, as well as by other acts on behalf of the dead. The church also commends almsgiving, indulgences, and works of penance undertaken on behalf of the dead. Again, Catholic Catechism of the Catholic Church, page 291, 1995. I was raised believing this. Wow. The Catholic Church was right around the corner from when I where I lived. I was raised in London, England. I went to Catholic uh, school. I went to church every Friday as part of our school. And I remember praying before the statues. I remember saying my Our Father, saying my Hail Marys, plucking my money in, lighting the candles. I remember all of that as a system that I thought possibly might enable me to get to heaven. And mm -hmm. then when I was 21 years old, I began to read the Bible, not just mm. the Lord's Prayer, the Bible, the Word of God. And in the Bible, you have this picture that is it, it diametrically opposite and opposed to this idea of purgatory and eternally burning hell. And it's a picture that's not only doctrinal, it's not only theological, it's a picture that reveals who God really is. Mm. As Pastor Shelton was sharing here, this is all about God's character. What kind of person is God? And when you look at the Bible, we look at all of these verses, please, don't argue with them. Don't fight against them. Let them speak to you first and foremost because if you put up barriers right away, you're not mm -hmm. going to see the big picture here. Mm -hmm. And the big picture mm -hmm. here is really about righteousness by faith. It's about what God has done for you in Jesus right. Christ. Right. Now, the author here points us to a scripture and it's found in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 27. Hebrews chapter 7, and, no, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. I want to read this, this verse um, for you here in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. It says here, and we're going to read verses 27 and 28. As it is appointed unto men once to die, mm -hmm. but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin mm. unto salvation. Mm. Mm. One time offering for all. Right. That's what the Bible right. teaches. Mm -hmm. It's a one time offering for all. Now this completely undermines purgatory. We're not dealing right now with the fires of hell, the eternal burning fire. Pastor Terry dealt with that. Pastor Day dealt with that. We're talking now about purgatory, this idea of an intermediate state where if you're not good enough to make it to heaven, if, you're not, mm. if you don't have enough good works to make it to heaven, you can work it off there. People can pray for you and possibly you can make it in. That completely undermines this, these texts that we just read mm. because these texts suggest very strongly that Christ made a one-time sacrifice for all. And if this was the only text in the Bible, it would be enough, but it isn't. <laughs> I want you to go back now just a couple of chapters to Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 27. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 27, notice what it says here. Speaking of Christ in his mediation, his heavenly priesthood, priestly mediation, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's. Mm -hmm. For this he did once mm -hmm. when he offered up himself. Mm -hmm. Now this flies right in the face of transubstantiation and the Catholic Mass, yes. which as a young man, I pr 
participated in over and over again, believed in that Christ was sacrificed anew, Christ was sacrificed afresh, that that one time sacrifice wasn't enough. This completely undermines that idea. So what you have here is you have the gospel. And really, as you move through the Bible and you get into, we, in our last session, we talked about Cain and Abel. As you get into the book of Revelation, it all comes down to the gospel. It all comes down to the lamb slain from the foundation of the world or man's teaching. A beast is a symbol of an earthly power and the people who follow the beast are following the, the teachings and the principles of earthly religion versus the religion of the Bible, right. the religion of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul knew this. Paul talked about a day when, when men would rise up among you, among the church, mm -hmm. and they would draw followers after themselves instead of after Jesus. Right. And they would start teaching perverse things. Paul understood this. And so in order to lay a foundation or a safety net for the church. Paul started talking about this one-time sacrifice for all the book of Hebrews. He knew specifically it was going to be uh, easy for the Hebrews to fall into this because there was a lot of legalism in the Hebrew mm. religion. There was mm. a lot of legalism among the Pharisees. Yeah. And so he emphasizes this. He himself, like I was raised a Catholic, he was raised a Jew. So he himself was speaking <laughs> from his own experience. He was blameless according to the law. I mean, he was circumcised on the eighth day. Right. And he did everything that you were supposed to do. He talks about that in Philippians chapter 2 and then he goes on to say or is it Philippians chapter Philippians three, 3 3 and then he's on to say you know uh, not as though I detained or already perfect but this mm -hmm. thing I do I press mm -hmm. toward the mark right, right? Mm -hmm. wanting to find not my own righteousness but the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. This is what Paul is doing. He does it in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 27. We just read that verse. He does it in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 28, but he also does it in Hebrews chapter 9. I want you to look here with me. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 12. Notice what he says here. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, mm. but by his own blood yeah. he entered in how many times? once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Now, verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Mm -hmm. Now I want you to slip over the page here and I want us to go in uh, Hebrews chapter 10. I want us to, to go into, uh, down to verse 10 by the which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. How many times? Once. Once, Once for all. Yeah. Now go to verse 12. But this man, after he had offered, how many One. sacrifices? One. One sacrifice for mm. sin, sat yeah. down forever, the right hand of God. And then another verse, verse 14, for by One, One offering he yes. hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. That's good. So Paul yeah. is emphasizing mm -hmm. this again and again. Paul, it's like Paul is saying, you know, I know our, our tendency is going to be toward relying on our works. I know mm -hmm. our tendency is going to be toward adding a little bit of Hagar into a little bit of promise, mm -hmm. you know, That's mingling true. a little yeah. bit of Hagar with the promise. But mm -hmm. we can't do that. We've got to come to the end end of ourselves yeah. and we've got to recognize that we are sanctified by the blood of Christ. We are justified yeah. by the blood of Christ. Everything we have, all of our righteousness, our fitness and our title for heaven is all found in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And you know what that does? When you find that you cannot earn, you cannot merit salvation, that everything in your justification and your sanctification is in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, it motivates you to live for Him as nothing else can. Amen. Mm. See, That's men right. think that you're going to be motivated by the fear of punishment or right. by the hope of reward. No, no, no. <laughs> the motivation that Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is the motivation of the love of God. That's right. The yes. love of God constrains us because we just mm. thus judge that if one died for all, then all were dead. And that He died that we should no longer live to ourselves, but live for Him who died for us and rose again. That is the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ, and it decimates purgatory, it decimates eternally burning fire. Babylon comes down when the gospel is preached. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Very That's nice. powerful. Pastor James and Pastor Terry and Ryan, what a great study. My name is Jill Morricone, and I have Wednesday's lesson, A Paradise with Disembodied Souls. Pastor James talked about the Catholic doctrine or teaching of purgatory, and this one is a very Protestant teaching, you could say, mm -hmm. the paradise with disembodied souls. 
that the body and spirit, Ryan set this up very beautifully at the very beginning, that they're two separate entities. The body dies, but yet the spirit somehow lives on mm -hmm. with intellect, with emotions, um, with some sort of thought process, whether it's floating around in heaven somehow or is somehow covered with a spiritual body of glory. But in whatever case, that the soul is eternal mm -hmm. and the body dies, but the soul mm -hmm. lives on. So I wanna ask you, why is there a resurrection? Why is there a judgment? Mm -hmm. right. If the righteous souls are already in paradise, right. Right. enjoying it, why is there a judgment and why is there a resurrection? Mm -hmm. We talked about this on previous weeks, that this unbiblical teaching of the immortality of the soul had its origin in the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. When Satan in, in, um, in the serpent said to Eve, what, you shall not surely die. And that was continued, we've discussed this before, in ancient religions and philosophies. Mm -hmm. The Egyptians taught this with the mummification practices. Mm -hmm. And the pyramids, you can see that they taught it. It was continued in Greek thought, in Western thought. Socrates taught it and Plato taught it. Continued into the Catholic Church and then into the Protestant churches. Many, if not most, of the mainline Protestant churches teach that the immortality of the soul. It's continued in secular culture today. Ryan referenced the Left Behind series just a few weeks right. ago. Uh, we see it in movies, we see it in TV shows, we see it in news articles, this life after death or this near death experience. We see this immortality of the soul and we know at the end of time it will be part of the last great deception of spiritualism and the immortality of the soul. Let's take a look at this biblical teaching. We're going to look at the resurrection and the judgment of the dead as well. So principle number one, we are not immortal. God alone possesses immortality. We are mortal. Mm -hmm. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because of sin, all will die. But eternal life is given as a gift to those who accept Christ. Number two, the dead in Christ are resting in the grave. They're not in heaven now. We know the soul that sins, it shall die. We know the soul does not continue on immortally. 1 Corinthians 15, 18 says, then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. We know that the dead are resting in an unconscious state until the call of the life giver. Amen. Number three, we know that the dead are resting in that grave awaiting one of two resurrections. Shelley, we're going to John 5. I know you like this scripture. John 5, 28 and 29. Jesus mm -hmm. sets forth very clearly the two resurrections. Do not marvel at this. For the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice mm -hmm. and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. That's the first resurrection. Mm -hmm. Those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Mm -hmm. That is the second resurrection. Paul taught the same thing. Acts 24, 15. This is his defense before Felix. And he said in Acts 24, 15, I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and of mm -hmm. the unjust. Yes. We know in Revelation 20, we won't read all of that, but if you look at Revelation chapter 20, we see that in verse five, the rest of the dead do not live again until the thousand years are finished. So if you read previously, you see that 1 Thessalonians 4 has happened. What do I mean by that? The Lord has descended with a trump and the voice of the archangel. Jesus has come visibly and audibly. Every eye has seen him. Mm -hmm. And those who have accepted him as their savior, mm -hmm. those who are Christians and claim the name of Jesus in his righteousness, mm -hmm. as you talked about so beautifully, have covered them. They will be resurrected in that first resurrection at the second coming of Christ. Go to heaven, spend the thousand years. But in verse five, it says, the rest of the dead, these are the wicked, do not live again 
until those thousand years are finished. And we know at the end of the thousand years, there will be hell, mm. as Pastor Terry talked about and Pastor Ryan. But it's not an eternally burning hell. Right. It will be a final judgment for the wicked. Right. Mm -hmm. The wicked will be resurrected. We call that the great white throne judgment mm -hmm. for that time of judgment. And then there will be final eradication of sin and it will not rise a second Amen. time. Mm. We have the example of David, the lesson references, the example of David resting in the tomb, awaiting the resurrection. This is in Acts chapter two. Remember Peter's mm. Pentecostal mm. sermon. And what happened? He says in Acts 2, 29, men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both floating in heaven as an immortal soul. <laughs> is that what it says? No, he is both dead and buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Then he talks about how Jesus was resurrected from the dead and is now seated at the right hand of God. And we pick it up in verse 34. For David did not ascend to the heavens. It's very clear. He didn't go up to heaven. He's, right. he's dead. He's resting in the tomb with his fathers. But he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The reference to Jesus, mm -hmm. the Messiah seated at the right hand of God. We see also the lesson reference this, the human beings, and we've talked about this in previous lessons, who are currently residing in heaven now. Mm. Oh, wow, what a gift. Mm. These are not immortal souls currently residing in heaven, to be very clear. Mm -hmm. The first one I can think of is Enoch. Mm -hmm. What does the Bible tell us in Genesis 5:25? Enoch, he walked with God mm -hmm. and he was not for God took him. Mm -hmm. Now, his body didn't somehow disintegrate in the grave and his spirit went on. No, 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 no. He was translated right. without seeing death. We talked earlier about Elijah, who was also translated. We see that in 2 Kings 2, 11. I don't know how Enoch was translated, but we do know Elijah It was a fanfare, right? There was the chariots and the fire and Elisha. Wow. And he got to see that. I don't know if anybody saw Enoch going up or not. Then we have the resurrections from the dead. We have Moses. I think Pastor James talked about that earlier in Jude 9. And we have that description of what happened. Yet Jude verse 9, Michael the archangel and contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Mm -hmm. And we see that Moses and Elijah were on the Mount of Transfiguration there with Christ. We have those who were resurrected with Christ. Mm -hmm. And we studied that just a couple weeks ago as well. We also see finally that Christ's resurrection is the guarantee of our future resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, we're going to end with this. 1 Corinthians 15, 16. If the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Our redemption, our forgiveness of sins, our assurance of salvation and hope of eternal life are all rooted in Christ. His perfect life, his substitutionary death, and his resurrection. Let's go on, verse 20. We're in 1 Corinthians 15, 20. Now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. You see, Christ's resurrection is both the representation and the guarantee mm. of the future resurrection. Amen. Others were resurrected before Christ. We already discussed that. But Christ is the one through whom all resurrections, whether past or future, are possible. Mm -hmm. And finally, verse 22, I like this. As in Adam, all die. What does that mean? Because of Adam's sin, we're all under the curse of the law. Mm -hmm. We're all under the penalty of sin. We're all worthy of death. And if it were to stop there, we'd be miserable, but it doesn't. As in Adam, all die. Even so, in Christ shall all be made alive. Christ fulfilled the claims of the law. He died once and for all mm -hmm. so that you and I could have hope and eternity of spending that with Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you. My head is swimming right now <laughs> and I don't, I know I've got to get to my notes, but let me just begin by saying this. 
God is love. That's 1 John 4, 8. That's his essential nature. God is light, 1 John 1, 5. That is his character of righteousness. We don't understand a holy and righteous God. He cannot sin. Mm -hmm. He is love. He created humanity that he could have children. And when he created the world, he put Adam and Eve in this perfect garden. Everything was perfect, mm -hmm. only one prohibition. He said, you can eat from all of these trees, just don't eat from this one tree of knowledge of good and life. It was a covenant of life. If you want to live, don't eat from this tree. But he said, if you eat from the tree, you're going to die. Dying, you will die. And you know what? Satan came in with that lie. Mm -hmm. You will not die. That's what's being preached mm -hmm. today is the same lie that Satan's always said. Eve was deceived. Adam was not. And what happened? The enemy, God had to stand up for his righteous judgment. He'd set the death penalty. Dying, you will die. Mm -hmm. He had to get them out of the paradise. He had to get them away from the tree of life because their living on was conditioned upon eating from the tree of life. Mm -hmm. The Bible clearly tells us, 1 Timothy 6.16, God alone has immortality mm -hmm. now. But the Bible also tells us that before he ever created the world, Revelation 13.8, he had a plan to save the world. The lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world, God stepped down, took on the human flesh, and became mm -hmm. the Lamb of God, even though in anticipation of the crucifixion, he was called that. He became the Lamb of God who would take away the sin. That's how much God loves you. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you something from the very beginning when he sent Adam and Eve out of the garden, he started a substitutionary sacrificial system that opened the pathway for righteousness by faith. We see Enoch, we see Noah, we see Abel, we see Shem, we see all of these people, Job, who are made righteous by faith. It's always been righteousness by faith. Right. God is the same God in the Old Testament that he is in the New. He's a God of love. Mm -hmm. And so what the Bible tells us in Romans 5, 17, or well, 5, 12, it says, by one man, by Adam, sin entered the world. But then listen to Romans 5, 17. If by one man's offense, that's the first Adam, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. I've got to tell you something. When sin penetrated, God had a perfect sphere of righteousness at creation. But when sin penetrated the heart of Adam and Eve. They lost mm -hmm. humanity, lost their spiritual virginity, and there is nothing, absolutely nothing that we can do to gain it back. Mm -hmm. Nothing. It is all about what Jesus did. Mm -hmm. We cannot earn our way to heaven. We can never pay that penalty for sin. Jesus, God says, I... For God so loved the world, he sent his one and only begotten son that whoever believed in him yeah. would not perish. But it's either you're going to believe in him and get eternal life or you're not going to believe in him. You're mm. not going to get eternal life. You're going to perish. Mm. So the whole thing here, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 45, what, what Paul writes is the mm. first Adam became a living being. The last Adam, Jesus Christ, came down to become the new representative of humankind. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. If it were not for Jesus Christ, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. He created all mm -hmm. things and then that's 1 John 1, 1 through 3. Then it says in 1 John 1, 14, the Word who was God 
became flesh and dwelt among us. He came to show us the love of God. He came to pay our penalty for sin and die as our substitute. His death was, uh, he was foreordained before the foundation of the world. In John 6, 40, Jesus says this, for my father's will mm -hmm. is that everyone who looks to the son and believes in him shall have eternal life and I will raise him up the last day. Mm -hmm. Now, first, I've got to tell you something. Believe here doesn't mean mental mm -hmm. ascension. That's right. Yeah. James says even the demons believe yeah. and tremble. No, believe means to put your trust in, mm -hmm. to follow him. See what God is looking for? He has this covenant. It's the everlasting covenant introduced in the garden. It was ratified with Abraham in the form of a vision. Jesus renewed this covenant and he ratified it. Hebrews 13, 20 says, with the blood of the everlasting covenant. And you know what the goal of it is? 2 Corinthians 5, 21. The goal of the covenant is the great exchange. Mm -hmm. God made him who knew no mm -hmm. sin to be sin for us right. that we might become the righteousness of mm -hmm. God in Christ mm -hmm. Jesus. That's the goal of the everlasting covenant. And the promise is we're going to be just like Abraham who was waiting for the city from on high, the city that was not made by man's hands. But what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, he explains when we put on immortality. Mm -hmm. And he, we've said this before, but it's so wonderful to understand. 1 Corinthians 15, 52, we get the everlasting covenant is finally fulfilled at the end of time. And Paul says in the moment in the twinkling of eye, and I at the last trumpet, he says the dead will be raised incorruptible. We shall all be changed. And this incorruptible must put on, I mean, this corruptible <laughs> must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. Mm -hmm. Here's the bottom line. First John 5.10. This is it. I mean, this is everything. Listen, 1 John 5, 10. He who believes in the Son of God, that means to put your trust in Him. God is looking mm -hmm. for you to enter into covenant with Him. He makes all of the promises. This isn't a contractual arrangement. God makes all of the promises, but He wants you to enter into a covenant with Him. Give Him reciprocal love. He wants you to walk in obedience motivated by love. And He says, he, 1 John 5, 10, he who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself because the Holy Spirit witnesses that we are the children of God. But he who does not believe God has made him a liar. Wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a wake up call. Mm -hmm. If you believe in paying penances, if you believe in paying indulgences, you're making God a liar. Mm -hmm. If you believe in purgatory, if you believe in an unceasing torment, you're making God a liar. Mm -hmm. First of all, let me tell you something. The word uh, that we use eternal and everlasting, it is aeonious. It is a relative term. It it relates to what it describes. So when it's talking about mortal flesh, when it's talking about like the city of, of Sodom and Gomorrah, it is talking about something that lasts till the destruction is over. But mm. when it's referring to Jesus Christ, when it's referring to the mortal God, it means for infinity without ceasing. And here's the promise. He says, anyone, this is the testimony, 1 John 5, 11 that God has given us eternal life mm -hmm. and this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not 
have the Son does not have life. Mm. If you believe in Jesus, that gift of eternal life mm -hmm. is your promise and you will put that on when the last trumpet is sounded and Jesus returns. Ooh, yeah. My goodness. Yeah. I told you it was going to be a hot topic. There's a fire <laughs> at the end of that table down there. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. We have learned a lot of truth uh, in regards to the fires of hell. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to take this time to turn it over to my family here for some final thoughts. <clears throat> I was just thinking that um, in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus gives this discourse about um, the, the sheep and the goats. And he talks about those who ministered to others and those who didn't. And he makes a statement in the middle of there. And he says, depart from me, you cursed into everlasting, everlasting fire mm -hmm. prepared for the devil and his angels. Mm -hmm. That's what the destruction is about. That's what this, this cleansing fire that is coming upon earth is about, is to destroy the arch deceiver and his angels and every trace of sin that they have brought about. Friends, I don't want anyone that I, that I know of to be a part of that. Choose Jesus. Get in and read your Bible and mm -hmm. learn and understand what the Bible says about this important topic. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Just a closing thought from the lesson quarterly on the lesson for Tuesday. The question is mentioned or the statement is made, what do errors like purgatory or eternal torment teach us about the importance of doctrine? Why is what we believe of importance <gasps> and not just in whom we believe? Mm -hmm. The answer? It is important because we what we believe reflects the character of who we believe. Mm. Yes, there you go. That's right. So there are Lord's many and God's many. There are other gospels, but there is no other gospel than the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. I was just thinking of that reference, God is love and in him is no darkness at all. You know, many of these beliefs to me have darkness. They have an angry God. They have a, a confusing God or a misrepresentation of the character of God. But if you study the Word of God line upon line and you compare Scripture with Scripture, you find at the very end, from the beginning to the end, that our God is a God of love. Mm. Amen. Amen. You know, Romans 5, 8, Paul says that God demonstrates his love for us by this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Mm -hmm. What an amazing promise. But then he says in Romans 8 and verse 32, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? He wants you to accept him that not only as your savior that he's paying your penalty of sin, but as Lord that you will let him justify you and get rid of the presence of sin. Amen, amen. Hellfire, God, you know, God does not intend to kindle hellfire for people, my friends. He loves you. That's why Ezekiel 33, 11 says that he does not find pleasure and the destruction of the wicked, but that we turn from our wicked ways and live. Amen. And so my friends, as you can see, we're all about some truth here at 3ABN. And next week, we're going to keep on the truth train. Lesson 11, <laughs> we're going to talk about some end time deceptions. We'll see you right back here next week.